At that point, I was so tapped out. I told him on the phone, I said, you could have said anything to me at that moment. Check into rehab, sell my business, leave my business. It didn't matter. My entire foundation of understanding self and reality was upended. You know, the other side of psychedelics isn't being spoken about as much. The concept of a bad trip is a misconception. Psychedelics is like 10,000 hours of therapy. That's not true. It's not. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more. More from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome. Welcome, Daniel. What's up, Ellie? I'm sitting here with Daniel Resnick, amongst other things, the uh, host of the Getting Out of the Way podcast, a psychedelic integration podcast. So we've been uh, talking a fair amount about um, psychedelics and sharing some of my own experiences on this podcast. And uh, I think you entered that world, that dimension, um, a little before it was cool. Hmm. So <laughs> I thought it would be um, appropriate to have a conversation with you, learn more about um, your background, who you are, and hopefully a lot of the uh, teachings that you've been generous enough to share with me, we can share with at the audience as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, it'd be great to figure some of that stuff out throughout mm -hmm. this process. So here it goes. Let's go. Let's get out of the way and make room for it. Yeah, man. <laughs> Where do we start? Where do we start? So a little about your, uh, your story. You grew up in New York? Uh, yeah. Um, grew up in New York, Brooklyn specifically. Spent pretty much my entire life in Brooklyn up until uh, the pandemic. And then the pandemic kind of uh, forced us. Oh, you're a COVID runaway. Pretty much. To Florida. I had yeah. no idea. That's <laughs> so interesting. When you came to Florida, I didn't understand that you were one of those. Yeah, I feel was... the need to explain that to people. It's like, no, I, I came 2005, 2006. Yeah, um, it was, I, I loved New York, Brooklyn boy through and through, but it uh, became very challenging to raise kids at home through the pandemic in the wintertime. It was uh, a two-week getaway that brought us to Florida. One-way tickets never went back. <laughs> there you For go. now. For now. For now. We'll see where, where life brings us. Yeah. In New York, after growing up, you were in, in business. And that's where, yeah. where we met in the hospitality industry. You were. Yeah, and that's still kind of active but passive um, in the background a little bit. Not my primary focus for the moment. Thankfully, I have a good team, boots on the ground, that could handle the show back home. And um, my kind of... Uh, path diverged from hospitality a little bit another Into? form another form of hospitality uh but really it's um it's all about my own process really um getting out of the way pretty much is uh self description it's it's kind of what i'm working on actively getting myself out of the way meaning my like lower self my identity the um aspects that block me from my higher self. So that's what I'm kind of pursuing. So when you say hospitality is not your primary focus today, what is? I understand the getting out of the way, but yeah. in, in practical and practical. No, that's very practical. I mean, it's a process of self-discovery, I guess, to a point, right? It's um, figuring out where I'm blocking myself, where I'm getting in my own way of living this dream more harmoniously. And we keep looking inward to find those blocks and we clear them out and we keep getting out of the way. We keep clearing this, uh, this concept of a self out, this objectification of, of, who we are, this story, this narrative. We just keep clearing it out, clearing it out so we can approach the moment in a brand new fashion. So before we dig into getting out of the way, which I, I'd like to do, I want to go back to who you were prior to recognizing that this should be your primary, um, that the primary purpose here is not about making money. It's not about uh, whatever, whatever it is you were focused on at that time supporting your family or whatever you thought your primary focus was, was at that time. Who was that person 
and how did they transition to um, the the person you are today working to get out of the way? Well, the person I was was the person I was conditioned into being to a degree. Um, you know, I was raised in a Western culture by immigrant parents and Russian immigrants specifically. Yeah, my parents immigrated from uh, the Ukraine in 79, made a stop okay. over in Italy, and then um, Brooklyn basically landed in Canarsie, uh, from Canarsie to Midwood, from Midwood to uh, Dumbo, from Dumbo to Prospect Park, moved around Brooklyn a bit, but um, that greater environment also It also basically comes with uh, a lot of other attachments, a lot of other layers of conditioning. And so you're asking kind of, you know, who I was. It's, it's, it's tough to separate, but I can recognize distinctions in between the way I see things today and perhaps the way I used to. And the way I used to was a byproduct of the way I was taught. And I was taught in school. I was taught at home. I was taught all of these um, ways of being by various people that were around me and I followed through on the teachings and it was, it was simple. It was like, uh, you know, I was a materialist, uh, believed in what my senses could recognize, uh, goal oriented linear thinker, the way school teaches us. You've used the term atheist to describe yourself as, as well. Not now I'm saying prior. Yeah. I think that goes with, um, hand in hand with materialism to a degree, because if you're only believing in, in your senses and material aspects of this life, then frankly, you forego anything beyond that. And to point um, at God, at source, at the creator, uh, transcends all of that. So I think that, yeah, if, if I label myself a uh, materialist, it definitely kind of comes with that uh, atheist inclination. You don't necessarily respect something you don't see. Right. Was it a uh, just an inclination, or was it also something that you um, sought to put on others? Right. Sometimes someone's an atheist, and they get bothered by some anyone who any spirituality. Oh, not at all. They, that wasn't. No, no, no. If it came up in conversation, I would be very happy to represent myself. And if you represent yourself as a follower of any particular uh, school of thought, then. God bless you. That's your thing. We can talk about it. I don't need you to wear my hat. I don't want to so wear So it wasn't yours. the, it wasn't atheist as a religion. It was kind of, that's where I am. It was kind of almost like, uh, you know what I more mean? More agnostic it. than atheist. atheist it's right. like, I don't see it. I don't know it. I recognize there's some intelligence behind this whole kind of unfolding, but I don't necessarily know what it is. I don't need to dig into it. Um, I'm kind very, of, I don't know and I don't care. Yeah. There, until there's a reason to. And so again, but, Goal-oriented, linear thinker, set a goal. Hopefully it has some kind of economic uh, <laughs> benefit at the end and, and go get it. Set a straight line and then, you know, just hustle your way to it. And uh, that was kind of the extent of my existence. It was rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. You know, get the spoils of war and go, right. you know, <laughs> spend them and, and do whatever it is that makes you feel good. And that's kind of, uh, that was the approach. I didn't know any better. So obviously psychedelics were a big part of this transition. Was that, Absolutely. Was that the first opening or was there something else that was going on prior that made you curious? Do you remember? Do you remember? Um, it was not an opening. It was like an A-bomb being dropped on me. So um, there was no one seeing it at that point, whether there were contributing factors along the way. I'm sure there were. Um, if I had to sit here and kind of nitpick at it, I'm sure I could find various uh, stepping stones along the way that brought me to that point in time where I decided to look at uh, psychedelics through the therapeutic lens. Was it a major search that you were on or just kind of No, happened? not at all. No, not at, It found me. It I found didn't you. find it. I wasn't looking right. for anything. I, my, I was very comfortable in my life. Uh, I was very comfortable with where I was at. I was very happy with um, kind of the way things were going. And somebody kind of, somebody who I, I, I love and I trust whispered into my ear um, that I should take another look at psychedelics. And I dismissed it instantly. When, when you say another look, you had looked at it before? Yeah, so the reason I dismissed it instantly is because uh, I used some of these substances when I was a kid, when 
Right. I was young and growing up in Brooklyn, all of this stuff was kind of around. So say mushrooms in the park as a kid or something. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, right. Cannabis and mushrooms and, you know, go to great adventure and have a great time and just laugh and enjoy it kind of with friends. And so I used it socially uh, right. for recreational purposes. And we didn't have at that point, I didn't have any uh, advanced education on the subject. So I didn't understand all of the former uh, uses, all the indigenous uses, the kind of uh, long storied history that it has in a kind of healing capacity. In fact, I didn't think I needed any healing. I thought I was, I, I thought I was dynamite. Everything was smashing. And then, um, like I said, someone who I uh, have tremendous respect for and, and love uh, whispered uh, to me that I should take another look. And that there was at that time, I think this was around, I don't know, 2000 and uh, maybe 15, 16, somewhere around there. Uh, there was a lot of research that fresh research that was kind of coming out into the mainstream. And uh, my buddy just suggested that I take a look. He said, it's not what you think it is or was. It's not how we used to do it. He said, take a look. You might be interested. And so uh, that kind of scratched my curiosity a little bit. And I decided to start doing the research. Um, the one thing that really kind of, uh, captivated my attention was that when I did get my hands on a lot of the data that was coming out of, you know, some of the top institutions in the world, uh, there was one common theme that kept being represented that I couldn't wrap my head around. And people from all different walks of life and backgrounds and colors and languages were pointing to a spiritual experience. And that did not compute. Like, I did not understand that. And I couldn't get my head around it. And I almost kind of went at it from the standpoint where I'm going to do this and I'm going to prove everyone wrong. Because I didn't necessarily believe in anything beyond the senses. I didn't believe in anything beyond materialism. I didn't believe in anything beyond my education, beyond my programming. So what was, um, what was piquing your curiosity prior to that? Meaning you wanting to go in to prove someone wrong, but there was something before that that was driving it. Was it just respecting a friend or was there something else that? It was, you know, the, the data was very clear. So the data was very, very clear. Very clear that what? So it's great for it, meaning uh, psychedelics in, with, with proper intention for therapeutic use is great for uh, healing sick people. It's also good for, uh, it was kind of identified as making well people better. And that was interesting. We always want to improve. We always want to get better. At that time, I started taking myself a little bit more seriously, started to kind of uh, look at my diet a little bit more uh, thoughtfully, started to exercise. This was all around the time when uh, I had my first child. And so uh, having a kid was really a profound moment in my life in that I started to take myself a little bit more seriously. I had a reason to take myself seriously. I wanted to be able to run around the park with my kid. I wanted to be able to kind of enjoy all the good moments. And I know that um, through, uh, through kind of seeing my dad's path, I saw um, how not taking care of ourselves is really detrimental to our health. And then beyond that is detrimental to our family because then we can't be there for them. We can't be present. We can't do the things that, you know, our and that definition needs. at that time of not taking care of ourselves is that just physical? Not, not today, but then was it physical? Was it mental, emotional, psychological? It was almost exclusively physical because I didn't recognize any, let's say gaps in my psychology. Um, you know, if I had an argument or a blow up, I would just write it off as being something very ordinary and very common. And that's what happens to us. It's fine. And, uh, you know, kind of pave over it, pave over it with the various tools that society gives us, whether it's uh, alcohol, whether it's, uh, you know, any type of behavior that allows us to um, mask over perhaps an underlying condition. Um, so these things were all available and they're kind of bona fide, meaning, uh, they're approved by society. So it's, there's a liquor store in every corner, you know, liquor was always in the home. So liquor was, it was okay. It was, if you needed that to take the edge off, there was nothing to look at. There wasn't, Hey, this right. is bizarre. It wasn't right. Exactly. It was, it was, it was, um, appropriate in fact. So, you know, what's interesting for me is as someone who, um, came to my path in a very different way than yours and that I was very much brought to my knees before I started looking around. Maybe that's the more common story, or maybe that's, those are the people I typically end up around, but that's the story I usually hear. I mean, think of the addict 
for lack of a better term. So someone who follows that path, the path of an addict, is obviously there's an issue, but it takes years for them to admit to themselves that there's an issue. They get are brought to their knees, and then they start looking around, and we start looking around. Your story is very different than that, it sounds like, where there wasn't any major... It wasn't the path of suffering, which is what you're pointing to. Correct. So what do you no. make of that? I don't make anything of it. I think all roads lead home. Do you, do you, hear, your sto- do you hear your story commonly? I mean, does this, does this happen? Do you hear more of my story? What do you, what do you see? I'm wondering if this is a, an anomaly of sorts. The reason I'm interested in it is because like, this should be the path. This should be, like, in an this ideal situation. What? This being we shouldn't have to like, have our heads broken open <laughs> to open our eyes. Like, it shouldn't take that much pain for us to say, maybe I should pay attention. I'll give you an example. You spoke about physical health. You ask the average person and you say on a scale of one to 10, where's your physical health at? Even people who are doing well physically will recognize a gap. Almost always. But just like you said, you didn't notice a gap emotionally or psychologically or, or, or otherwise. Like that is almost never noticed. And if it is, people want to see this massive one. Like I want the equivalent of a 350 pound obese person who can't get out of a chair without breathing heavy. I want that emotionally in order to say, Hey, maybe I should go to a therapist or maybe I should read a a self-help book, or maybe I should take a look inward. So meaning I'm interested in teasing that apart with you a little bit, because for me, it's uncommon and hearing and, and, and hearing it from others is uncommon. What do you, what do you make of that? Is there anything you can share or seen or, identify with yourself. How did you get to look at yourself without it being a path of suffering? Was that just a gift? Was that an awareness? Can no, it was curiosity. Articulate it? It, it, was, it was an intellectual curiosity. That's really what it came down to. Uh, whether it's common or not, uh, I can't really speak to that. I speak to so many people from so many different walks of life that have so many uh, different backstories and they kind of all lead to the same place. How many bumps along the way is very dependent on um, the conditions that that individual perhaps might be dealing with. So you had a term for my path. You called it the path of suffering. Do you have a term for yours? Um, If I had to label it again, it was just intellectual curiosity that got me to the point where I wanted to know what I didn't know. And if everyone's saying that there's something beyond these senses that's out there, I said, well, I want to know, I want to see. I want to disprove it. Right. You know, I want to tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but that was just to kind of validate my own personal narrative. And so when I had um, an encounter of significant proportions in the psychedelic space, it invalidated my narrative. And now what? I was going in there to invalidate this common thread of spirituality. I said, for sure not. I know better. And then I have an experience which completely disproves everything that I had my feet tethered to. My entire foundation of understanding self and reality was upended. But why do you say an experience could disprove? Like if I'm devil's advocate... If I've never had a psychedelic experience, I'd say, okay, so you did something and it showed you something and it's, it's bullshit. Well, what happens when it's a greater version of this reality where we find ourselves? What do you do then? How do you know it's real? How do you know this is real? Exactly. No. <laughs> How oh. do you know that's real? We're using the same tools. Here and now, how do we know this is real? So all the same tools, all the same means and methods that we are using to validate this particular reality are still applicable in other states of awareness to a degree and more still. And so when that feels realer than this, what do you do? Much like a dream, a dream feels real when you're in it and then you wake up from it. And you recognize, oh, wow, that was a really vivid dream. It really got me. I was really captivated. But here I am in bed. Here I am. I'm awake. And then poof, you wake up from that state of wakefulness to a higher state of wakefulness. What do you do? You can't unsee it. You come back. 
But now you're left with that perspective of the greater reality, which you can't wipe away. What's so next? Is it a, a perspective or maybe experience is a more... The experience lends itself to perspective, to perspective. so sure. Right, but a perspective, I can share my perspective with you. I can't share my experience with you. I can share my perspective with you, and now you have my perspective. And then using that perspective, I could experience the world around me very differently, if I'm right. willing to put it on, if I'm willing to carry it around, if I'm willing to not dismiss it out of pocket. So one psychedelic experience completely challenges everything you were kind of basing your day-to-day -day life on. Absolutely, yes. And since that time, that has led to a pathway of self-exploration, which you call today getting out of the way. I realized it became getting out of the way when I realized that I was the one that was blocking that experience from being realized in a here and now present moment. And all of the conditioning and all of the backstory that I was clinging to was actually the block. And so it became evident that if I could clear that out, I get to experience that greater sense, that greater state of reality, a higher awareness that I got to touch that day all the time, as long as I'm not blocking it. And so the pathway became clear in that I have to find within me everything that's blocking that pathway and get it out of the way. So you said the, the backstory is kind of, the is part of part of that thing that's in the way. So can you give an example of something tangible that was part of the backstory that you've been working on or have got out of the way. And as a result, you're seeing this benefit. Like, why would I embark on this path of getting any of my backstory out of the way? Why is this useful? More is better. More of what is better? Exactly. So hmm. constantly, it's being repeated to us that more is better. Oh, that, like that backstory. It's part of it. Right. It's an example. It's an so example. You know, it's something that we can kind of wrap our heads around. So everyone's telling me more is better. Don't have so much money. Not loving my situation. I make a correlation that I'm not loving my situation because I don't have so much money. And so I go to make more money. And I make more money. And I'm rewarded. Everything works out. And I have this money. And after a little while, again, not feeling so great for whatever reason, well, spend the money. Spend the money. Get the things that money can buy us. Enjoy them. After a little while, maybe not so enjoyable anymore. Not giving us that same high. And so again, not feeling so comfortable for whatever reason. And then running that playbook over and over and over again, getting more and more and more, kept leading to a series of highs and lows and highs and lows. And I love roller coasters. I just found myself living on one and that got very uncomfortable. And we recognize that all those lows are a byproduct of seeking out all those highs. We keep getting high. And getting high is not a problem. It's coming down that's the problem. And so more is not necessarily better. But that's the way I was raised. That's the way I was trained. And I was actually good at getting more. But I kept getting low. It never lasted. And so that was some conditioning that I was carrying around that was getting in my way of experiencing a state of pleasure for any prolonged period of time. And that got very uncomfortable. That makes sense. Immediately after your experience, was life better or worse? I didn't know what to make of it. I could only talk about it now that I have some context looking back on it. I can say that the first couple of years were extremely difficult. Because my foundation of self and reality, again, were upended. And now what do I do? Now I have to learn how to function again. I have to learn how to see this place again. 
and how to see myself all over again with this new perspective. And so I didn't have a community to tap into at that point. I didn't have a guide or a guru. I didn't have anyone um, that was there to help me integrate my experience. What about your friend who had turned you on to this in the first place? Um, he was not of any capacity to deal with what I was going through because he didn't have the same range of experience. And so because the integration piece of the puzzle wasn't presented to me and I wasn't necessarily respecting it, um, I had to integrate myself without having all the tools. And that happened over a long period of time, two, two plus years, where, um, where it was just really difficult to live life the way I was living it before. I couldn't do some of the things I was doing before. Like I couldn't take a drink of alcohol and make myself feel better when it used to work for years and years and years. In fact, I took a drink of alcohol and it repulsed me and I couldn't even drink again. And now I can't even do or use a substance that I was using previously that was working all the time. Now I can't even use it again. Now I can't even take it. Now what? Now where do I turn? And, you know, we can explore every vertical of life that I held near and dear prior to that experience. And they were just ineffective. And I didn't know which way to turn. I didn't know where to go anymore. So now you weren't even getting the highs that you once were getting. They made me feel low instantly. Something right, that yeah. used to make me high and then low right away made me feel low right away. So I didn't know, you know, I didn't know where to turn. I, I just had no clue. And right. it was uncomfortable for me I, and my family because my family is going through this at the same time. Right. I was going to ask you if I, um, if I asked your wife then to describe like what was going on, like what words would she have used to describe you at that? Oh, man, destabilizing. She married one guy uh, for very specific <laughs> reasons, right? And um, we knew each other on one level. And now all of a sudden I show up and I want to change. I want to change myself. I want to change the relationship. I want to change my outward expression of self. I want to change it all. And she's like, whoa, whoa, slow down. What's going on? It was very uncomfortable for her. It was very, you know, destabilizing right. for her as well because I'm ready to flip the whole board over and start <laughs> again. And she's like, whoa, we have, you know, we have a child, we have responsibilities, we have a life that we're creating and making. And I knew that going back to the old model would not bring me any peace. Right. It wasn't even an option. It was not. Point. Right. It was absolutely seen, not an option. You had seen so the it was other very side tough. of it. It was, it was very tough on my wife and, and God bless her for sticking with me through the process. And, um, so this, in some ways, was your path of suffering. It was post, uh, post ceremony, the what? suffering, the suffering, right, exactly. post ceremony. Whereas suffering brings people, let's say, as Very you put often. it, you know, to their knees, to where they're looking for any kind of uh, exit for the pain and suffering. I didn't realize I had any, and then I have this one experience that flips the dynamic, and now all of a sudden I find myself on and a that. lot of suffering. Yeah, I yeah. think this is an important conversation because you know the other side of psychedelics isn't being spoken about as much you hear a lot of people talking about their amazing experiences i've had that as well and i haven't shared as much about on this own on this podcast i haven't shared as much about the other side of psychedelics you know and speaking to someone Are you else pointing to integration well no not only integration but pointing into like this discomfort that it set up for you it was when realizing that what, everything you think you know exactly. is false correct yeah, that's that's a right. That's very uncomfortable. Different flavor of suffering. Yeah, right. You know, it's special right. all its own. But yeah. Right. What I said to um, I was speaking to someone the other day, and he asked me what I thought about um, psychedelics for him. A few people had recommended it, and what I thought about it. So I said, "Well, I can't make that decision for you." But I said the best analogy or metaphor I can give you for it is having a child. I said many people say that. Um, psychedelics is like 10,000 hours of therapy. That's not true. It's not. Because there's no amount of therapy I could have done to have the experiences I had on psychedelics. It wasn't hours of therapy that I was missing. It wasn't in much the same way. There was no amount of experiences I had in life that could have given me the 
joy and fulfillment and whatever feeling we want to use for having a child. At the same point in time, once that child enters the world, everything is different. Your weekends are different. The fact that there's a little human being walking around the world who can get hurt and it hurts you, like that's a real experience. I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know what the word is. It's just a different dimension to your reality. And do you want to, with children, maybe it's talked about, maybe it's not, but I think there's a certain understanding that if I add a child into my life, that yes, there's a wealth of experiences and there's a different dimension that I'm living life on. I've just added another dimension, but now I've added all sorts of other things, responsibility and cost and potentially sadness and all sorts of other things into the experience as well. And I think psychedelics, that's the best metaphor I had for it is that you're adding a different dimension to your reality. And are you ready for that? You're birthing your inner child. <laughs> so you like my metaphor? I do. It makes sense. Um, And is maybe this, um, this, the suffering you went through over that two, three year period trying to integrate or harmonize what you had seen in your experiences to what you were living day to day. And especially the fact that you had a wife and a child at this point. So it wasn't just you who had to integrate. You couldn't run away to India and integrate on a mountain. You had to integrate, right? In real time, right right, right in the fire, which is the best place to do it. So maybe some of that suffering is what led you to a lot of what you do today and what your focus is. Absolutely. How do we, how do we help people who are having these experiences integrate it faster and more comfortably than your own experience? It's an awareness campaign of sorts. And so much in the way that therapeutic psychedelic use was reintroduced to me in my adult life, integration wasn't a part of that conversation. And when I was doing my research, I was focusing on the experiences, not looking at what happens afterwards. And uh, since I had some element of disbelief surrounding the kind of spiritual aspects of the experience, uh, I discounted it. I didn't even need to look at any of the research surrounding that aspect of the experience because I didn't believe it. There was no point for me to waste my time. And so I really focused on just the experience. And what happened was after my experience, as we discussed, my whole story was kind of like upended and it took me a couple of years to integrate. And so I realized after my personal experience that many other people looking at myself as the model, many other people are going to kind of stumble into it the same way. Well, even if they don't stumble into it, if they went into it the way I did through the path of suffering. I went in only to remove my suffering. I didn't, I didn't expect to birth the inner child, so to speak. But like you said, was you it can't. made clear to you that integration is 50% of the uh, psychedelic experience? At first, no. And that's the thing. It and it really. wasn't for me either. Right. And what's happening is now as this conversation is getting more and more mainstream and as psychedelics are uh, being kind of discussed for all the value that they bring to the table, um, people are going to get curious. People are going to get their hands on these substances, which mother nature is very happy to supply. And what happens if someone has an experience like we have had where they have the psychedelic experience, they don't have the integration piece understood. They don't have an outlet for integration. And so they find themselves in a tougher situation where, uh, they don't have a community and they have to integrate on their own. And if that same process takes them two, two and a half years, and if I could provide a shortcut by expressing my experiences, then it's my duty to do that, to make sure no one else falls into that little pitfall because I've discovered it. And so since I've discovered the pitfall, my job is to stand up and tell everybody, hey, watch out, don't go this way. There's, you know, there's a pitfall here. So let's speak to that. What, What are some of the hazards of psychedelics without integration? See, we can get some profound awareness within the psychedelic space when we're kind of accessing this uh, higher consciousness. And we come away from that experience. We have this awareness. What do we do with it? What's next? If we don't integrate it, 
it could wash away very quickly if we just fall back to our old behaviors. And if we don't necessarily have the tools to integrate, even though we want to, also it becomes, let's say, quite challenging uh, to do it alone. What's that? But you said it fall back to the old behaviors. So, okay, so I had an experience, and several months later, I'm back to my old behaviors. No harm, no foul. Fine. Let's What's see. the hazard there? Well, you're going to figure it out because the reason that brought you to psychedelics in the first place is still very much present within your system. And so you have your experience, you have your awareness, you refuse to integrate it or choose not to for whatever reason. And you, say, you don't oh, know. Just fall back or you don't know. You don't know about it. People and don't, you just fall people back. People do not to, talk about it. Right. And you fall back to your old behavior. The underlying cause for bringing you to psychedelics in the first place has not been resolved. It's still there. So it's still going to redirect you to healing. And that's really what's happening. That's why we're coming around to therapeutic use, right? Because it's a healing process. And so if you don't address the cause, the cause is still there. And so you're saying no harm, no foul. I'm saying, fine, roll with that. Try that out. And what's going to happen if you don't address the cause, it's going to manifest as a variety of different symptoms. Might be the same symptoms that you were exhibiting before, might be a new range of symptoms, but you've never addressed the cause. So one way or another, either it's going to bring you more suffering, which will bring you back to some modality of healing, um, or perhaps you're going to be that unique individual that says, okay, everything worked out and I'm fine. I can go back to my old model and my old patterns and I'm great. Was there a point in time after your first psychedelic experience, and by psychedelic experience, I mean a therapeutic psychedelic experience, that you wished you had never gone there? No. Not for one second. No matter how difficult and how uncomfortable it became. Said I'm still, I prefer this than the, I prefer the uncomfortable truth rather than the comfortable lie. Yes. Even though it was taking you several years. Do you know of anyone who has had that experience where they said, I wish I never did this? Yes. So what, what was that? Because what I'm trying to flesh out. But they've had other experiences since then. Right. What I'm trying to flesh out are the hazards of psychedelic without integration. Like, what are the actual risks besides for, say, okay, I'm going to stay caught in a loop for longer than is necessary, and maybe the suffering will have to amp up in order to, to get my attention. Is, is there real risk in, um, in psychedelic without integration? Or it's you're saying... Um, I would just, eventually people are going to have to get there, so let me help shorten this path. Is the distinction I'm making clear? I think so. Um, as far as the associated risks, if we're not talking about certain mental health conditions that could be exasperated by using these substances, specifically like schizophrenia, you know, um, I don't know that the data points to any other risks, perhaps, um, that would preclude one from pursuing this pathway, but do your own research, speak to your team of healthcare practitioners, whatever it takes to check the box, evaluate the risk profile as you would anything else. Um, there are risks living this life. And I think as part of that evaluation could be someone listening to this conversation and saying, okay, here's someone who lived that risk for a few years, who lived in that period of discomfort where it wasn't a risk. It was a recalibration of sorts. Right, and that recalibration is very uncomfortable. Going to the gym is uncomfortable. Sure. You know, I um, was speaking to someone who had, I think, one or two um, psychedelic experiences, and the first one they spoke about was extremely uncomfortable. They called it a bad trip. So I do want to address bad trips for a second. And the second said it was very comfortable and pleasant and peaceful, and they felt a bliss. but. Um, when they got home, they found themselves just a little bit more angry. And a couple days later, 
their spouse sits them down and says, I don't know what this thing was meant to do to you, but you become irritable and angry and impatient, and I'm not liking this new you. I, um, and after that, they said, okay, I'm done. I'm done with psychedelics. So can we speak about each of those experiences, right? A, the bad trip, which when I asked them, I said, what do you make of the bad trip? Um, and they're not a they. I'm just intentionally staying away from uh, the gender so as not to mess with anyone's privacy. Um, when I said, when I asked them, what, what do you make of the bad trip? That well, maybe I took too high a dose, or maybe the practitioner didn't know what they were doing, or something else, right? So can we address kind of those two as far as um, an integration perspective? Meaning what happened here, obviously, was psychedelics without integration, right? There was no conversation afterwards. I have this experience, a bad trip. What, would, what, what's your, what do you think about bad trips? I think it's a bit of a misconception and we're quick to label things and judge things without having context over things and what's bad in general and what's good in general. Right. And so we, this is part of our conditioning. This is a part of our programming to evaluate and label everything immediately without having any context. But a lot of times the fullness of time allows us to look back at certain aspects of our life and see them brand new. And there's a, Beautiful quote uh, by Kierkegaard that goes, life is only understood backwards, but left, best lived forward. And that's really what it comes down to. It comes down to letting go of the judgments and evaluations. The trip you got is the trip you got. You don't have context. Don't judge it. What was bad about it? And let's dig into it. And that's where integration really kind of um, takes root. And that's where it could be very special and profound because I've had people that have said they've had bad trips and no trips, frankly. And then when we start to integrate and unpack it all, they get a brand new perspective after a quick conversation. So when you say no trip, meaning they didn't feel anything. They say, well, that's what they say. Yes. Um, that happens. And through the dialogue of integration, we unpack an experience that was a nothing and it's evidence that it's actually something and not only something perhaps something very profound as well and we can do this kind of in real time on an individual basis it's hard to do it hypothetically but just to come back to the bad trip because it seems to be a big part of the conversation now because it's a fear and so the science is clear on on the values and benefits but then people will come out and say, well, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to have a bad trip. Well, I say, what does that mean? I'm afraid I'm going to see something I don't want to see. Isn't that the point of why you're doing this in the first place? We come to the, we come to the understanding that we've, let's say, repressed certain aspects of self. And once I recognize that I'm not living my authentic self and I've been repressing my own authenticity, after a while, perhaps it gets uncomfortable. It gets uncomfortable to live this life through this role that I have without being able to be the most genuine version of myself. And so there are various modalities of healing that we can explore that will help to address that friction and Psychedelics are one of those pathways. And so if I elect to go down that road, I'm basically saying I want to give space for all of that stuff that I've been repressing to rise up. I want it to rise up so it can finally pass so I don't have to deal with it anymore. So I'm making a conscious decision to say that I want to see what I'm holding on to so I could finally get rid of it. And so it comes to the point where I have my experience and all of a sudden something's coming up and it's heavy, it's dark, it's coming from the shadows. And I say in that moment, I don't want to see it, which is a contradiction. As soon as I say to myself, I don't want to see it, now I start wrestling with it because it's coming up. Right. It's coming up. You've made a conscious decision to bring all of this stuff up 
to your consciousness, to your awareness, so you can finally let it go. And now it's coming up and I'm saying, well, I didn't think it was going to look like this. I don't want anything to do with this. I want to run from it. And now you're trying to run away from yourself <coughs> in a state that makes it very difficult to do so. You can't run anymore. And a bad trip is an out of context categorization of my reluctance to accept the experience as it's unfolding. Can, can you make this um, shift after the experience or does one have to make the shift during the experience? The shift you mean? The shift from bad trip to, uh, if you can use a different term, right? Just uh, maybe a difficult trip. Can that, you're saying it's a reluctance to Accept what to, is. To accept what is. Can that shift be made after the trip, after the experience, after the journey? I mean, sure, why not? Meaning once someone has said, right, so someone is going through an experience, something is coming up that they start wrestling with. Mm -hmm. So obviously that gets pretty difficult because mm -hmm. it's not a great place to push things down. We've just invited everything to come to the surface. Right. And now there's one thing we push down. So now we're focused on the one thing right. we're pushing down and that becomes the next couple of hours. And that leads into the second example. The well, individual that you pointed to that what's came up, before, out of their experience right. and was angry. What's up? Before we go there. So that pushing down and everything else. Mm -hmm. So now a person walks out of there mm -hmm. and says, okay, I had a very bad trip because I fought this thing for two or three hours. And that was supremely uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So now what you're talking about, that reluctance to accept, can that shift be made post-journey? Yes. And they still can turn from a bad trip to a, diff to, to a difficult trip with lessons for me. Absolutely. Because, again, the concept of a bad trip is a misconception. So it's going to resolve itself anyway in the fullness of time when we can look back on it. In the moment, it might have been difficult, and difficulty we're quick to judge as being bad. But we know that difficulty is where the growth happens. Okay. It's when we go outside of our comfort zone that life begins, as they say. And so much in this way, we can look back on that experience in the fullness of time and see it from a fresh perspective. Um, so the answer to your question is yes. So there's actually two awarenesses that one can have is A, that this conditioning that we have of labeling things as bad is something we can let go of. Lesson number one. We should, because should. that's judgment. And who right. are we to judge? And how are we judging? And on what data are we judging? And so that's a lesson all its own. Correct. And then lesson number two is whatever the thing they were wrestling with, like I had... Um, now is at a surface level. Correct. Now you can deal with it because uh, you didn't see it before. Correct. I now didn't see it, see not, it. In the, not in the fullness of it. Now you can't it. unsee it. Correct. And now resolve it any way you want, whether you're going to go back for another psychedelic session, whether you're going to go to talk therapy, whatever you want to do, but now you see it. Now it's at a surface level where you can actually do something about it, much like the uh, example of B, the individual who's angry. Right? Same person. <laughs> awesome. So they're in their process. So when they look back on the process, they'll be able to understand it for what it is, as opposed to seeing it from that very narrow perspective that they were trying to evaluate it in, uh, in the moment. And so, but what you're saying is, is it does take a fair amount of trust then prior to going into the process to believe that it's going to benefit me almost before we embark on this journey. So I was talking to someone when, once and they, uh, they said to me, I didn't know them uh, well before, but they were given my number and they said, um, they, they had an, uh, I think it was an ayahuasca experience. Um, actually it wasn't, it was a mushroom experience. And it was, clear from the experience that at a, as a two or three year old child, they were sexually abused by their older brother. And they asked me what I thought of it. Like, do I think it's true? <laughs> so I said my, well, I went more into like, why is it important if it's true or not true? Like, let's tease that apart. Like, let's say it is, let's say it isn't like, why, why do we have so much weight on either end of these things? Not that we shouldn't, but what does each one of these mean? But separate and apart from that question I asked is, but why, why did you do it if you were doubting it? Like, what made you go into this process, which is difficult, right? It's four, six hours of, I mean, losing 
complete control of oneself and being subjected to losing the illusion of control, the illusion yeah. of control. But it's it's a feeling that could be very uncomfortable. Right. And it's an unknown. So why would anyone subject themselves to that unless there was the certainty that it had something of value to, to offer me on the other side of it? In other words, that wrestling <clears throat> with whether or not I'm going to trust the path that this is going to take me on kind of should be done before. Like before I decided I'm going to enter the 12 steps and start you know, throwing myself into this, this process, which is pretty uncomfortable. I had to get rid of a number of my friends. I had to bring a sponsor into my life who I had to start following direction from. I didn't have to, but I chose to. But as soon as I did embark on this path, it would be a waste of incredible amount of energy and time if I wasn't willing to follow the directions. So I did, but I didn't throw myself into the 12 steps until I spoke to a number of people who I found had a, a freedom and a peace that I wanted. And in talking to them, I understood that they were feeling the similar, at a point in their life, they were feeling similar to the way I was, the same demoralization and hopelessness I was feeling now. And I'm saying, hey, you were able to get from here to there with that. I'm going to trust this path. And when it got uncomfortable, you know, my sponsor told me, Ellie, no dating for, no dating for how long? Until I tell you. Zero, none. No communication with a female in any romantic Wait, why would I agree to that unless I had already decided that this person and this path has something to offer me? Do you think there's something similar with, um, with psychedelics that prior to embarking on the path, one should wrestle with or research whether or not this is something they, they can trust? Well, absolutely, you should do your research. You should not take anyone's word for I it. I understand, but and, research but for this same, purpose. Research for this purpose. I mean, listen, if you're feeling like something's wrong, explore every pathway to address it. Why not? They're all available, right? There are many ways to heal. And whichever path you pursue, you're going to make that decision based on the information you have at hand. So you do your research. Figure out all the paths that are available. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm saying they're all complementary. So definitely do your research. But one way or another, you're guaranteed no outcome. There's no specific outcome that you're guaranteed, Correct. meaning it worked for your buddy in, you know, in the program. You did your research. You moved forward because you recognized there was some relatability between his story and yours. But you weren't guaranteed his outcome. No, you're not. And yet you still did it. Right. You're not guaranteed the outcome. but. Um, so what made you trust to pursue a path that someone else was presenting to you beyond the fact that your stories were relatable? Well, one was that my way really wasn't working. Like it, there was nothing about this that I, there were aspects that I wanted. Sure. Right. I didn't want to lose the money and I didn't want to lose the house and I didn't want to lose these friends and I didn't want to lose that pleasure. Sure. There were aspects but there was enough not working that I was willing to negotiate with all of it yeah. and saying like, okay, all in if there's a different way. And I saw peace on the other side, meaning, um, you know, they, in, in the 12 steps, they have something called the 12 promises, right? Meaning if you follow these 12 steps, these 12 promises will become true in your life. None of the promises look like more money. None of the promises look like a relationship. None of the promises are physical. The promises are, I'm trying to think of a, a couple that I can um, remember, but you will know a new freedom and a new happiness. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear, as an example, two of the promises. Do you feel like psychedelics offers a similar promise? Yes. And again, it's one of the many pathways that are available to us when we take our healing process seriously. Right, as you said, and all paths. And do your them. research. I'm not saying one over the other. I'm saying they all work. Right, like but you said, what all you identified them. was like you know that's why the path of suffering is so, um, such a direct route, because you're suffering so much where you're willing to do anything to address the suffering. 
you'll turn over every stone. You'll do all the research. You'll try all the modalities of healing because it just got so uncomfortable inside. Right. And that's why it's such a direct route. And um, there was an experience I had with my sex addiction where um, there was a story that I had that it was an experience that I had once with two women, okay, to be specific. And it brought me to a sense of like everything disappeared, everything quieted out in a way nothing ever had before. There was enough distraction and noise in that room to quiet everything out. And after I had this experience, I said, okay, this is top shelf. My top shelf experience is two women. And if I can, I'm not going to go there often. I'm going to go there when I absolutely must because this works. And I guess somewhere in the back of my head, I had already had other top shelf experiences that, became the second to top shelf for the third to top shelf over time. And I said, I got to keep this as a top shelf. And I remember this as if it was yesterday. I was feeling horrible, horrible, horrible over just a number of things that were going on in my relationship, in my business. Um, you know, just everything kind of not feeling right at the same time, a lot of pressure on me. And I said, okay, time to pull off the bottle from the top shelf. And I had an experience and it did absolutely nothing for me. I felt like I felt as if the same, I, I walked in the same way I walked out and I, I was petrified. I said, okay, like this was my, this was my ticket. This was the answer of all answers. When everything else wasn't working, I can take this bottle off the top shelf, take a swig of this and everything quiets down and it didn't do anything for me. And I understood where this goes. I have to search for the next in order to find the top shelf. Never ending. Fortunately, about a month before that, my therapist introduced me to someone who was in recovery, 12 steps, uh, dealing with the fact that he cheated on his wife a number of years before. And it was clear from talking to him that there was a level of peace and calm um, that existed in his life today. But I didn't do anything with it. I just had heard him from a couple conversations. But after the panic I felt walking out of that experience, I called him up. And I remember that as was yesterday. And I said, tell me what to do. Just tell me what I got to do. He said, uh, tell me what I got to do in order to, to kick this. Because I, I see where this is going. I'm just, I'm going to be reaching for that next thing on the top shelf. And my sense was that it can get much more dangerous and much more dangerous, physically dangerous and, you know, otherwise as well, dangerous very quickly. And he's, um, he said, okay, I'll give you the, uh, I'll tell you it works. And he's like, I want you to commit to going to 90 meetings for 90 days. Done. I want you to commit to meeting with me once a week. I want you to commit to writing out every fear that comes up and putting it down on paper. I want you to commit to doing a gratitude list every morning. And there were five things, may have been one more that he gave me. It was done, 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 done. Like at that point, I was so tapped out. I told him on the phone, I said, you could have said anything to me at that moment. Check into rehab sell my business, leave my business. It didn't matter. At that point in time, I was so desperate. And that's what you're talking about, that, that path of suffering. I had a sponsor who told me once that the, the desperate are sweetly willing. Yeah. Yeah, suffering leads to salvation, no doubt. It's not the most comfortable. It's not the only way. No, it's, it's not, not the, the most only comfortable. way. It's not the most comfortable way. Um, but it's quite efficient. Because <laughs> it gets you to the point where you say, man, I'll do anything to relieve this pain. Right. And sometimes we actually need that. We need to come to that place within ourselves where we're really serious about healing. And until we get to that point, whatever pathway we choose might not have the same effect. Do you have a definition for healing? It's not a definition of healing as much as it is a recognition of discomfort and pain that wants to be addressed and we negate our way into it, so to speak. We start eliminating everything that causes us pain and discomfort and separation and uh, we find ourselves already healed. Um, see, the default mode is sweet, it's beautiful, but we just get in the way of it. And so we have to undo everything that keeps us from that default mode of being healed because that's how we start the game. So just to parrot back what you said in different words, healing for you is being willing to look at everything that's in your life 
and willing to and be, being willing to eliminate any or all of them so as to get back to that place of peace, freedom, or not suffering. Meaning, meaning healing isn't a state of becoming as much as a state of returning. That's a great way to put it. I was saying in my words what I heard from you. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. It's a great way to reframe it. And it is an undoing of sorts. It's an undoing of everything that keeps me from being in the flow of things. And when I find myself present in the flow of things, everything is really sweet. Everything is really beautiful. And so anything that bumps me off of that path, bumps me off of that awareness, uh, is an inhibiting factor. And that's what we want to undo. And if we undo everything that's blocking us from that default mode, we find ourselves healed. We were always healed the whole time, except for all the ways we thought otherwise. Beautiful. Beautiful. You used the word, um, words, you used the word earlier when talking about um, what you didn't have for your own integration. You used the word community. Is that part of your uh, motivation in a building, say you're getting out of the way podcast, the psychedelic integration podcast, that someone who's going through experiences has the ability to tap into a virtual or online community of others who have experienced, who've had these transformative experiences and figuring out how to integrate them into the, into, to the life in the most comfortable way. Is that part of the goal? I think that, Community is a byproduct of the effort. Human beings, we like to gather. We're tribal, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. And so when we share our experiences openly, honestly, clearly, we release a lot of the stuff that we're holding. And there's a magnetic quality to that process of revealing the inner truth and it attracts onto itself other individuals that resonate with that process. And so it organically assembles and we call that community, a community centered around the release of pain and suffering seems like a community I wouldn't mind participating in, but it is not um, a driving force in my effort. It's the byproduct of the effort. It's a beautiful byproduct. Understood. Beautiful. You know, a shaman Omar, who's someone we both um, know, as this uh, term he uses, he says, turning a gift um, into a blessing, right? Your experience of finding your footing after psychedelic experiences over two and a half years, two and a half to three years, that was your gift. And then the blessing that you then share with others. Yeah. The years that came after. Absolutely. The, right. But it's the, the blessing meaning blessing for yourself, but also a blessing for, for, for others. others yeah. That absolutely. Now share with others. Because as I started to go further down this path of self-discovery and healing, and revelation, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that I was feeling better, thinking clearly, seeing things for the way they were, and just living my best life when I thought I was doing it previously. And so the people that were around me, friends and family, kind of recognized that there was some type of shift in my personality, in my behavior. And they would come over to me, you know, and ask, well, what are you doing different? Like, what's going on? Did you change right. your diet? Did you change your exercise? And I'd say, well, if you really want to know, it was this. And I would present them with psychedelics. Um, not physically, but the concept of right. it. 
and that kind of uh that kept happening it was it was a recurring theme in my environment at a certain point and you pay it forward in that way you give people the awareness that there is a pathway there that can help even if you think that everything's okay um especially if you feel that something's not okay and especially if you're really suffering and uh yeah you just kind of pay it forward you give them the knowledge you give them the awareness allow them to do their own research but a lot of the times we don't turn to certain pathways because we don't know they exist and that's why you know I point back to it being kind of an awareness campaign um the awareness campaign is is going strong when it comes to the therapeutic use of psychedelics but the integration piece isn't quite there yet and that's why my focus started to become integration because I realized that, hey, people are going to get this anyway. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's talking about the potential. It's very interesting and it's very exciting to know that there is uh, a way to heal in such a profound and efficient fashion. And there's no shortage of access. Again, right. this is Mother Nature, you know, puts these tools on the earth. They're very easy to access if we know what we're looking for. Um, so everyone's going to get their hands on it, but what happens afterwards? And that's why integration really became front and center in my mind as being, um, an aspect of the experience that's underreported and requires its own level of awareness. Uh, so that these experiences don't set people back. So they actually can integrate some of these awarenesses and move forward with the process as opposed to getting awareness, not knowing how to integrate it and feeling even worse off because now I got the awareness. I'm not sure what to do with it or how to do anything with it. And now um, I feel worse. And now I say, well, you know, I'm broken. It didn't work for me. It works for everybody else, but it didn't work for me. And we want to uh, help people through that process to the degree possible to um, really highlight the value of integration. A lot of people, myself included, say it's a 50-50 process. 50% is the trip itself, the and awareness for, that yes. comes from it, and the and other 50% is what you do with it. Because, yeah, that's... you know, uh, I use a parallel all the time. If you're, you know, in your experience and all of a sudden you get the winning lottery numbers, you're not going to start jumping up and down right away. You realize that there's a practical aspect that you have to get out and play the numbers. <laughs> and if you don't play the numbers, getting the numbers isn't any good. In fact, it's worse because then you look at it in hindsight and say, wow, I got the numbers and I didn't play them and look what I missed out on. And now I feel worse than I did before I even got the numbers. That's so, a beautiful analogy. I mean, you know, integration is key. And that's really kind of where my focus is, integrating my personal experience publicly with everyone um, so that if anyone can find any value in my experience, great. It can shortcut them in their process a little bit and at the same time helping individuals who are having these experiences without a community without someone to integrate with in a uh forum that also lends itself to uh other individuals so, so publicly way, interviewing others who've had experiences and and helping them integrate and then helping them integrate on the podcast and then helping others by by listening to it yeah, people, I mean, you know, we're all dealing with so the human condition. So is that an condition. invitation? If someone had what they're considering a bad trip, or if someone had um, found themselves very angry or irritable or discontent after an experience. That's exactly who I want to speak to. Reach out to you. Because I don't want them sitting there and suffering. That would be cruel. I want to say that, hey, you're, you're missing half of the puzzle. And, you know, find the Getting Out of the Way podcast on YouTube or on Instagram. Uh, the channels are monitored, reach out. Like we want to hear from you. We want to talk to you. We want to integrate this experience. And by integrating it, we transform it. We take something, uh, you know, quite kind of abstract and out there and we turn it into something practical that we can snap into our model of reality and use on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not very practical to have ceremony every day, but if you integrate a ceremony the right way, you get a takeaway that you can literally use all the time. And um, those are exactly the type of people that I want to speak to. Right. This is beautiful because, you know, we're, we're tapping into um, medicines, plants that have been in cultures for thousands of years. 
And in those cultures, they have, and this is something you shared with me, and in those cultures, they have um, systems around it. What do we do with these tools, right? In much the same way, you know, in, in modern day society, we have technology or weapons and or cars, and we have rules around it. Okay, well, someone's going to get a driver's license, and then at 18 years old, they're going to drive a car, and for the first couple of years, they're going to not drive past 9 p.m., and they're going to have an, an adult sitting with them. And there's a certain training that goes along with this tool that we're suddenly giving a lot of people in, in society, or they're getting somehow. And with um, psychedelics, many of us are getting access to this tool, and you know, I feel new to it on the one hand. It's only about three and a half years since my first experience, but I'd say 90% of the people I talk to have had their experience in the last year, last 12 months. So it seems to be growing exponentially, mushrooming for lack of a better, <laughs> better word. And you're someone who's been on the path even a little bit longer than that. And as someone first, your earliest conversations were saying, hey, this is something you may want to pay attention to in the same way as to you. And now that awareness is out and saying, okay, previously I was talking about psychedelics, but let me tell you the next thing you got to pay attention to is the integration of psychedelics. And I'm sure there are others, right? As we start, as these tools get incorporated into our culture, listening to those people who've been on this path for longer and have eyes wide open, paying attention very carefully to what, what these lessons are, and especially working with, many, with, with people and speaking to people and having conversations about these saying, okay, here's, here's someone we need to listen to. So I hope the people who are listening who are interested in this conversation, you know, or are interested in the conversation of psychedelics understand, hey, this is someone who's been on the path for longer, who's been focused on this very heavily, and some of the hazards that exist along the way, he's either experienced directly or experienced secondhand through others, and understanding what those are. There may be others, but for right now, you're saying the, um, the, the flashing light that has to be paid attention to is integration. We're entering psychedelics, and it's great that that awareness is there. Number two, integration, integration, integration. For those who want to know more, to visit the Getting Out of the Way podcast. Yeah. Um, and I'm not the only one, obviously. No, no but one is the only one, but in much the same way, we have people who speak in English and in Hebrew and in French and in other languages. We, we, we need people who talk in ways that we can understand. Within English itself, there are people who talk and talk to us, and there are people who talk, and it goes right over our head. So for people who this conversation resonated with, I hope they, they visit you. Not necessarily because you're the only one, but because you are, one of, you are doing it. You are doing it. You're living this life. Yeah, and uh, the more of us that share our experiences along our journey, whatever that journey is, uh, the more we can inform those around us. And with that information, people make more complete decisions. And so it's what we owe each other um, as a society to just share what we're seeing along our journey. Beautiful. I love it. So here, here's what I want to do. What I want to do is kind of put a pause on on this conversation and say, okay, this, for, for those who are, um, listen to this, this is Daniel Rez Resnick. You've heard for two hours who he is. Want to know more getting out of the way podcast. And then I want to introduce kind of the next thing we'll be doing together, which is, um, you've been an invaluable guide resource and support on my own journey, both in life and psychedelics, which I guess start to merge. <laughs> more and more Thank those you. two worlds and what i'd like to do is have some conversations and break those into separate segments so the idea is presented in the fullness of it and not lost in a conversation where we take certain ideas that you find yourself um repeating the most often or re reminding yourself the most often about and let's give a section to maybe three or four of those core ideas and then those will be put out as separate um, discussions. But I think for this conversation, I think um, we gave a pretty good background on who you are, how you came about to do what you do, and, this, and, and why you're an important person in my life and why I wanted to sit down with you. And then we'll have separate conversations where we talk about uh, those specific things. And I hope that uh, 
you enjoyed this conversation. I certainly did. And I hope those who listened uh, got a lot out of it. And yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me over. And um, yeah, thank you. Awesome. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs> <laughs>